warm, warm welcome to you. It's a blessing that we are allowed to freely have service. I'm very thankful for that. Um, so we're glad to have you here with us today. Just some notices this morning. So uh, to begin with, our country of the week is the country of Burundi. So let's pray for uh, Burundi and uh, the over 9 million people there. And then also Berkshire is our county of the week. So let's pray for uh, this county. And then our missionary of the week is the Kelly family. And we're repeating them because uh, they are the people we're trying to help with our Christmas offering. So if you'd like to, to give in that, um, you can do that today or, or next Sunday. And then we'll uh, send any of the funds. So just to do that, you can, if you do online, just put Christmas offering or use a giving envelope and just mark it for that. They're, they have a great ministry there helping people overcome addictions. So we're trying to be a blessing to them this Christmas. So on Wednesday, there'll be no Bible study here uh, in the church building. But if you're home and have time and want to join us, uh, we'll have it over Zoom. We're going to be looking at the topic of the rapture. Uh, but it's actually going to be at 7.30. Um, some of the people from the from Colchester are going to be joining us. So I'll send you the link, or you should have the link, but I'll, I'll send a link, another link to you. Uh, then Friday, if you want to join us, we'll have a Christmas Day service at 11. You're very welcome to join us. Can't do a lot on Christmas, but we can go to church, thank the Lord. So if you want to join us, you'd be very welcome. And then there'll be no outreach or music practice this Saturday. Uh, next Sunday, our services should be as normal, God willing. We are trying to organize a mission trip to South Africa, so um, you can find out more information on our website about that. Um, so that's the 21st or 30th of June. And also, we are hoping to offer uh, Bible Institute classes again. We did this several years ago, and so there's a leaflet on the back table about the Bible Institute um, it's going to be on Saturday mornings from 9 to 11 uh, here at the church building. And uh, our, the first two classes we're going to look at are Bible doctrines and methods of Bible study. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about the Bible, uh, this would be a great opportunity for you. You can also uh, tune in online uh, for that. So um, that starts, I think it's like the 23rd or 24th. I think it's the 23rd of January. So um, if you're interested pick up a leaflet, let me know. All right, um, we'll take up our offering at this time. Um, if you, uh, God's prospered to give, you can give. And while we do that, we're going to be singing a song. So if the singers want to go ahead and come on up here, um, and we're going to sing a few songs for you. But let me pray, and then uh, we'll, we'll sing whilst the uh, offering is collected. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship you. I pray you'll bless Lord, the country of Burundi and the need for the gospel there, we pray for Berkshire, pray for the Kelly family, you'll help them, Lord, with their work there, reaching the those with addictions. Thank you that we can be a blessing to them this Christmas. Thank you that we can meet together today. Thank you for how you've been so good to us, and I pray you'll use the offering, Lord, uh, to for the furtherance of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
So Christmas often is time that a lot of people think about giving gifts, and I know that uh, probably the uh, children in particular are excited about that. And then, of course, you also enjoy giving gifts and seeing people being excited about gifts. Are, are anybody, Emmanuel, are you excited about Christmas? Do you think you're going to get any gifts this year? Not sure. Do you think your brother's got you any gifts? Don't think so. <laughs> a little more confident that's probably not happening. Well, today we're going to talk about one of God's gifts to us. And we know the greatest gift in all the world was Jesus. Uh, the Bible actually says he's the unspeakable gift. I mean, if you think about you can give a lot of things, but to give yourself or to give your son is beyond what anyone would expect. But we're also going to think about what are some of the gifts that come out of the fact that God gave his son. Now, in Matthew chapter number two, uh, we have the wise men coming to Jesus. And we're going to notice that when they came to Jesus, they brought some gifts to him. And very likely, uh, this had some impact on the tradition of giving of gifts. Uh, it is always interesting to me how on the time we celebrate the birth of Christ, we give each other gifts. And so I think we need to think about what are we giving to the Lord? Are we giving our hearts? Are we giving our lives? Are we giving of what we have to Him and to serve Him? But notice with me, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Come down then to verse number 9. It says, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And so they are giving gifts because God has given the greatest gift, the gift of his son. Let's, let's ask God's blessing on the word today. God in heaven, help us this morning to be able to understand how wonderful it is to be given the gift of your righteousness, a gift that is very different from uh, the gifts that we think about, a gift that is spiritual in nature, but a gift that is also eternal and can never be taken away, can never be tainted because it comes through the promise you made uh, to us through your Son. And so help us, Lord, to understand it. Help those who may be have never received the gift of salvation that makes us righteous. Help them to understand the need to do that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, if you notice, we, we've entitled it the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. Now, um, Christmas is coming around and um, my kids are pastor's kids. And so, because they're pastor's kids, they're very spiritual and very godly. And they don't want anything that this world has to offer. And so for Christmas, they're going to get envelopes and inside there's just going to be Bible verses. <laughs> and the look of joy on their face is, yes, thank you for the greatest gift, God's word, God's truth. I'm just joking. I'm not quite that naive to think that they're, you know, they are very spiritual, but, you know, some practical gifts is good, too. So the gift of righteousness, what is a gift of righteousness? Like, is it, is it uh, an Apple product? Is it, you know, can you, is, does it involve video games? Does it, can you drive it? None of those things. So why is it a gift and why is it a wonderful gift? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. So I want to ask you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number one. Ephesians chapter number one, because God makes a big deal out of this. And if you think about God's gifts, usually when you get a gift for someone, unless it's a um, like a gag gift or sometimes people even call it like a, a white elephant gift or something, 
unless you're deliberately trying to just play a joke, you usually think about what do they want. Like if I was to get Terry, you know, like a hammer and a new set of, you know, like spanners, she'd be like, what, you know, what happened? You know, she doesn't want that. So it'd be kind of foolish for me to get her a gift she doesn't want. So you think about, you know, what would they like? What would they enjoy? What do they, what do they keep mentioning, you know, just casually? I noticed my kids, you know, within earshot of their mother, oh, it would be nice to have this, you know. Um, so we think about what do people want? So when God's thinking about us, why would he give us righteousness if it wasn't something that we needed? And hopefully, by the end of today, you'll realize it's something that we should want and we should value. Roman, or Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So notice he is describing for us that God is the source of all blessings. And as a result of all that God has given us, we should bless Him, which really just means we should praise Him. We should magnify Him. And Christmas is going to be a little different for us this year. A lot of the things that we come to expect are different. But that doesn't change how good God is. That doesn't change how much He's done for us. And so we should praise God and we should praise Him for His spiritual blessings. Look what the Bible says. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. So they are blessings, but they are spiritual in nature. They're um, not material. God didn't give us, uh, God does bless us with these other things, but the main blessings He gives us are spiritual blessings. So righteousness is one of those spiritual blessings. And that's a wonderful thing because it goes beyond this world. How many of you have noticed that no matter what you get for Christmas one year, you still want presents the next year? I remember uh, for my birthday, my, we didn't do a lot on Christmas, but at birthdays my parents would give us, they would kind of go all out and get us big presents. And I remember one Christmas that I got a gift and um, it was, I was young and I wanted this water gun. But this water gun would, it was just an amazing water gun. And I was so excited about it. It was hot. My birthday was in June. And I let my brother play with it. And he was running. And he was running across this little bridge we had across the river behind our house. And as he was running, the two posts were on the side of the bridge. He was running and he ran. He snapped it in half on my birthday. This is my big present. And I remember thinking, this is a very fun you know, so whatever we get, whatever the world offers, it doesn't last. But when God gives us these spiritual blessings, they do last. Now, notice what the Bible says. They're spiritual blessings, and they are in heavenly places. So the blessings that Christ gives us are rooted and based in heaven. They're not here on this earth where they can be lost or stolen or broken. They're in heaven. And then notice this. They are in Christ. We have to recognize that the source and the channel through which all of God's blessings come to us is through Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the gift from which all other gifts flow. All spiritual blessings come through Jesus, come to those who are in Christ. Now, we're going to talk about the, just the one, really, from this passage. But before we look at the gift here, notice verse 13. How do we get in Christ? There are people who are either in Adam or in Christ. Their, their identity is either a descendant of Adam and a part of this human race, or they are in Jesus, and they are a part of a new spiritual family, the children of God. When we're born, we're all born in Adam. That means we're identified with Adam. Who was Adam? Well, he was a human being. And when we were born, we were born as human beings. We were born sinners. Adam sinned, and so we were born as sinners. We were also born knowing we're going to die one day because Adam sinned, 
and he died, and so we're going to die. And that is, that is the, the situation we all are born into. But then if we believe on Jesus Christ, we are placed in, we're, we're no longer in Adam, now we're placed in Jesus. And Jesus is not a sinner. And so in Jesus, everyone that's in Jesus is righteous. That's the way God views them. Uh, Jesus is, is eternal, is going to live forever. And those that are in Jesus, they have everlasting life. So when the Bible talks about being in Jesus, being in Christ, how do we get in Christ? Verse 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So how do we get all these promises and blessings that come through Jesus? Well, it's very simple. We hear the word of truth, we hear the gospel, and we believe the gospel. That's why we talk so much about the gospel, so much about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, because when we trust in Jesus, when we believe the good news of what Jesus did for us on the cross, and we place our faith completely in that, then we are, we are placed, we are taken out of Adam, and we are placed into Jesus. And all of the promises that God has given us come through our identity with Jesus Christ. And so it's open to everyone. Anyone can hear and anyone can believe. And anyone can be saved and anyone can have this new identity in Christ. Okay, go back to verse number four and notice what the Bible says here. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So here we find that God, the first blessing, the first spiritual blessing he gives us is that we would be chosen to be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, I'm not going to ask you to say anything, but have you ever, and don't answer, please don't answer, okay? Have you ever done something you shouldn't have done? Don't tell me what it is, okay? Don't, don't confess anything to me. Have you ever done something you shouldn't have done? Now, think real hard, and it's going to be difficult. You've said something, you've thought something, you've done something. I'm hoping, not in a bad way, but I'm hoping that you realize there's a lot of things you've done you shouldn't have done. That you're not thinking, ah, I mean, I have talked to people. No, no, I, I mean, I'm like, what? How is it possible that you don't have anything to be ashamed of? If we're honest, there should be a lot of things that we know we're wrong. There's a lot of things that we could be blamed for. But look what the Bible says. The Bible says there's coming a day that those that are in Jesus will be before Him, before God, without any blame. If you were to die right now and stand in God's presence, what emotions would that cause you? Would it make you think, oh, that's kind of scary? Because here's the thing about God. God knows our hearts. God can, I mean, it's more than just reading our mind. God actually knows what we're thinking. And God knows what we're feeling. And so God knows every part of us, but yet He has made it possible for those that have believed on Jesus to stand before Him holy and without any blame whatsoever. I think that's pretty amazing. I think that is a wonderful thing because I know that there's a lot of things I'm ashamed about, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for me, all of that's been dealt with. Do you remember the first, the first sin in the garden? When Adam and Eve sinned against God, what did they want to do? They ran and hid. Because sin brings shame. But God's made it possible for us to stand before Him without any shame, without any blame. Let's go on to verse number, um, verse number 5. So, verse 4, He's chosen us in Christ. And we know that that is open to anyone. We've already looked at it in verse number 13. So it's not like God says, I'm only choosing certain ones and I'm not choosing others, he's chosen, he, he, he has chosen a particular group, and that particular group is all who believe on Jesus, which is open to everyone, okay? Um, but verse, four, verse 5 is similar. It says, having predestinated us 
unto the adoption of children by himself. So now we have another big idea here that we need to explain, predestination. A lot of times when people talk about predestination, they use it to say that some were predestined by God to go to heaven and some weren't. But if you look at the, the verse, it actually doesn't say that. It doesn't say he's predestinated us to be saved. He's predestinated us to the adoption of children. When we think about adoption, we often think about a child who maybe doesn't have a mother or father or has been given up for adoption. So the child's not a part of the family, then they're brought into the family. But this adoption is, is a little bit different. The adoption that this is talking about is talking about a child who is now given all the rights and privileges of being a full adult heir. My relationship with my kids right now is different than when they, than when they become adults. When they become adults, uh, they are gonna, it's going to be more like, more like we're equals than right now where I'm like, you got to get up at this time, you got to go to bed at this time, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this. And God saves us because He wants to bring us to maturity. He wants, and, and notice it says He's predestinated us to that adoption. Um, best way I know how to, to explain it would be like, how many of you have been on a train before? Anybody here ever been on a train before? Of course, we've all been on trains because we live in London. So uh, if you go to Grove Park Station, you can get a train to Charing Cross, I believe. Or, or let's say London Bridge. London Bridge is our main, our main hub. So you get up there, you're like, this one's going to London Bridge. And so you go up there and you see, okay, at 10 past 2, there's going to be a train going to London Bridge. And so that train has a predetermined destiny. Somebody sat down and said, at 2 o'clock, we're going to run a train to London Bridge. And 30 minutes later, another one. So if you want to go to London Bridge, what do you have to do? You have to get on the train. Once you're on the train, you just, you just relax, right? Or you, well, you stand there and try to relax, you know. Uh, maybe not anymore right now. It's got lots of space. But once you're on the train, unless something unforeseen happens, you're going to end up at London Bridge. That's what God's talking about here. And so what God is saying is, you can be in Christ through faith in Jesus, and I've chosen that everyone that believes on Jesus is going to stand before me, holding without blame, and I have predetermined that everyone that believes in Jesus is going to get to the place of full maturity, and they're going to be made like Jesus Christ. So that's the, pre, that's the predestination that's talked about here is God has promised that everyone that believes on Jesus is going to get to the place that they are like Jesus. And ultimately that's going to happen when Jesus returns and we get a new body and we will then be dressed fully in, uh, in that new body, we'll be dressed in His righteousness and we will stand before God holy and without blame. And this should be a great encouragement because in our Christian walk, at times we can get discouraged and we can think, you know what, I know I'm supposed to be, I know I'm saved and I know that I've been forgiven, but I'm not living the way I ought to live. And I keep messing up and I keep making mistakes and I keep failing. Um, I keep not living out who I am in Jesus. And God would say to you, oh, don't you worry. I'm going to get you there. It would be like being on that train and be like, oh, we're not there yet. How, how are we going to get there? It doesn't really matter how worried or how relaxed. If you're on the train, you're going to get to London Bridge. And if you are in Jesus Christ, He is going to get you to the adoption of children. He's going to get you to that point that you are, you are like Jesus. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 says, It is not yet revealed um, what we will be like. In other words, we're not all... Let me just, let me just read it for you because it's a great verse. Uh, so 1 John 3, verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. So those that believe are sons of God, but it says, It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So, 
People look at us and say, no, they're not much. They, they, don't, seem, they don't seem super righteous. They don't seem super good. And what we would say is, well, it's not yet revealed what we're going to be like when Jesus returns. But God is getting us to that point, and that is our predetermined destiny. Everyone is welcome. All are invited. Whosoever will may come. And when you come to faith in Jesus, you're placed in Jesus, and God is going to get you to that place to where who you are is revealed in the way that you behave, in the way that you look. And God is getting us that stage. So this is a, a very generous gift. That's the, that's the first big point. It's a very generous gift of God giving us His righteousness. But the second thing we need to understand is that the gift of righteousness is given to very undeserving people. So let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter number 3. We have to recognize that we're not righteous. Um, if you were to... If you were to give me a gift for Christmas and you were to give me a red tie, you know, so you gave it to me, I opened it up, and it was a red tie. How do you think I would feel about a red tie? What do you think? I'd be kind of like, oh, a red tie. A uh, chaps. Was that Ralph Lauren? Oh, this is posh tie. This is actually Church in America gave this tie to me. A chap's red tie. Amazing. Just what I needed. That way when I spill gravy on this one, I have a backup, you know? You know, really, not that excited if you already have it, you know? If you gave me, if you gave me an, an iPhone XS, I'd be like, I guess I can talk on two, you know? <laughs> but if you already have it, then you don't really appreciate it. Unless it's those sugar cookies, and then you're like, I'll take some more of those. You know, th those, that'll do me well. So what's the big deal about the gift of righteousness? Well, it's a really big deal if you realize how unrighteous you are. So look at Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved, both Jew and Gentile, that they are all under sin. As it is written... There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now, I don't know if you caught all the no's and none's and all's in there, but God leaves no space for degrees of righteousness. He doesn't say, well, you know, they're pretty good and they're a little bit worse, and, you know, they're, they're not very good at all, and they're really bad, the way we kind of do, because we're like, well, you know, I mean, I'm not over here with, like, terrible people. I may not be over here with good, I'm just, I'm on the spectrum here, you know, I'm, a, I'm an all right person, you know, I've not robbed any banks today or this week, um, you know, I'm, I'm a decent, I'm a decent person, but what does God say? He's like, nope, you're all over there. You're all unrighteous. You're all unclean. There's, none of you are good. That doesn't mean that there aren't degrees of bad, but it's kind of like saying, you know, you have degrees of, 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 of a, you know, a, uh, a, a death, a terminal illness, okay? It doesn't matter how, if you have a little bit of it, it's not good. So God says we're all in that camp. We're all in that crowd. Verse number 13, he says, their throat is an open sepulcher. That means an open tomb. Nobody wants to open a tomb because there's a dead body inside. And that's nasty. Nobody wants that. But he says that's the way the human, the human life is like. Where if you, if you look inside us, there's not good trapped in there trying to get out. Like Disney says, there's, there's death in there. You know, there's, there's wickedness in there. Uh, he talks about like the poison of, a, of an asp or uh, like a, a, a snake here, a, a venomous snake. That's in our lips. We're, we're totally sinful. Uh, if you look, look on verse 14, their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace have they not known. Everything about us 
is unrighteous. Uh, there's no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 19, we know that what things serve the law says, it says to them are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Verse 19, every mouth may be stopped. In other words, we can make excuses. We can say it was my, you know, it was my upbringing. It was my brother. It was my sister. It was, it was the government. You know, I'm this way because everyone else has made me and God will stop us in our tracks and stop our mouths because He knows and He wants us to know we have no excuses. We're all guilty before God. And when we recognize how lost and how unrighteous and how, how short of God's glory we fall, and then God turns around and says, here is a gift of righteousness, suddenly it's the most wonderful thing. And so if you're thinking, gift of righteousness, big deal, it may be because you don't realize how unrighteous you are. You don't realize how God views you. Read back through those verses and recognize that's talking about you. and That's talking about me. So then we come to verse number 21. So it's a gift that's given to very undeserving people. But thirdly, it's received only through faith. Look at verse number 21. But now... So in light of all of this, this condemnation, this, this case, this, this court case against humanity where all of our sins are on display, God comes up with another way for us to be righteous. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law, without any keeping of the law is manifested and it's been witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's something that all of the Bible's been pointing to. And it's been showing us that every person who's ever lived has fallen short. Even if you think about it in your Bible, you read these stories, you know, and you read about how, um, you know, the whole world is wicked, and then there's one man, right? Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, Noah. He gets off the ark and sins. Then you come to Abraham. Abraham, what a great guy. He leaves his land, and then you read about his life, and you're like, he had some problems. And you read about David, a man after God's own heart, and you realize he really messed up, didn't he? Every man who's ever lived has all fallen short of God's glory. So the whole Bible's been pointing to the fact that man, men are all sinners, but there is also a way to be righteous. And this is found in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is... By faith of Jesus Christ. There is a way to be righteous, and that way is by faith, by believing on Jesus. And this is for everybody, but it's only upon those that believe. There's no difference. Verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we are justified, which means declared righteous, freely by His grace. So you and I can be made righteous and declared righteous and stand perfectly before God and we don't have to do anything. It's free. And that's what grace means. It's a free gift and it comes simply through trusting in the work that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. It's received only through faith. It goes totally against what religion says. Religion it might sound strange because you're like, you're a pastor and we're in church today, but religion will say this to you. So you've done wrong. All right, you've done wrong. Uh, you need to do this thing. And you need to do this, you know, you need to pray and you need to come to church and you need to, um, and other religions will say, you need to not eat these things. And, and, uh, and, and maybe, just maybe, if you do enough good, God might just let you in. But that's still not going to work, is it? It's like if you ever try, you know, we have a new year coming, you try, like this year, I'm really, you know, I'm going to really count my calories. I'm going to, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to run every day. I'm going to, or if you try to do a Bible reading plan, I'm going to read a Bible, you know, a month into it, you're like 17 days behind. And it's just like guilt and condemnation because you're like, ah, I'm falling behind. Giving someone more rules and more things doesn't make them righteous. It only 
further exacerbates their guilt. But Jesus died and took all of our sin. The Bible says in verse number 25, God set forth Jesus to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Propitiation, the only other time that word uh, is in the Bible is in Hebrews uh, chapter, did I write it down? Hebrews chapter 9 verse 5 where it's, where it's, it's interpreted the mercy seat. And a mercy seat was basically a, a uh, they had a, an, an ark in the Old Testament and they would bring the blood of the, that was, that was shed and they would put it on this seat. And underneath that, inside the ark was the broken law. And so when God looked at that, he didn't see the broken law. He didn't see their failures. He saw blood. And when we trust in Jesus, what happens is he doesn't see our sin because he sees the blood. He sees the blood that has been shed. And to him, he could forgive us because our sins have already been paid for. Like the illustration I've used before, but if we were throwing a cricket ball and it broke the neighbor's window, we could go to the neighbor and we could say, we're really sorry that your window's broken. Will you forgive us? And the neighbor might say, I forgive you, but the window's still broken. But if someone came along and paid to repair the window, then the neighbor could, could rightfully forgive us and be reconciled to us because the damage has been sorted out. And Jesus sorted out all the brokenness our sin caused when He shed His blood. And so then God can give us the righteousness of Jesus because He took our sin and He gives us His righteousness. And so when we recognize how sinful we are and how unrighteous we are, we appreciate God has made me righteous. Let me show you one other passage of Scripture before we finish this morning. And I, and I hope you'll just take some time and meditate upon this yourself. Uh, but in Philippians chapter 3, there's one other barrier, there's probably many barriers, but one other barrier we'll look at today, to people appreciating and accepting the gift of righteousness, and that is when they are self-righteous, when they are confident in their own righteousness. In Philippians 3, the Apostle Paul was writing to people who were impressed with how good they were, impressed with how righteous they were. I don't I mean, I'm not a terrible person. But he says to them in verse number four, he says, uh, sorry, verse three, he says, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and we have no confidence in the flesh. He says, though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. So there were some who were saying, you know, we are pretty good people. And he says, if you think you're good, you should look at me. You should see how good I am. And he goes through this long list. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, all these things. But look at verse 7. He says, the things that were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. As long as we are holding on to our own goodness and trusting in our own righteousness, we will not be able to receive the righteousness of Christ. And, and you might be thinking, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I've not really done anything that wrong. I'm, I'm pretty confident I've done okay. As long as you are confident in yourself, you will not be able to be saved. God requires us to humble ourselves and to admit that we're sinners and to trust in Him. Verse 8, I doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. One of the hardest things for many of us is to recognize that we're lost. The truth of the matter is, if you looked at my life, you would think I was a pretty good person. I, mean, I grew up in a Christian home, and I could look back at my life and compare myself to a lot of people and think, I'm oh, a pretty good guy. You know, I've not, I've not done what a lot of people have done. But that in itself is actually one of the most dangerous things you could imagine. Because if I think I'm okay, then I'll never realize how much I need Jesus. I had to recognize I was prideful. I was self-righteous. I had a wicked heart. And I might not have done what a lot of people have done, but I had, 
I had thought all of it in my heart. I had, I had all of it right here. And it wasn't until I recognized how sinful I was that I was willing to trust in Jesus. And the moment I did, He gave me His righteousness. So I don't know how you feel about your relationship with God. I don't know what you think about the thought of standing before Him one day. If that brings fear to you, if that brings uh, a measure of concern, and it should, but if it brings that concern because you've never trusted in Jesus, you can believe on Jesus Christ today, and you can be saved, and you can be forgiven, and you can be clothed in His righteousness, and you can be able to stand before Him holy and without blame because of what He's done. That's the gift He's offering, and that's why you should trust in Jesus. Don't trust in your own righteousness. Don't trust in your own goodness. And then what about those around us? What about our friends, our family, our neighbors, people who think they're okay? May God help us to somehow, with the gospel, show them how much they need Jesus. Let's pray together this morning. Thank you very much for being here. And if you've never trusted in Christ today, I hope that you will. If you have, will you thank Him? Will you say, Lord, thank you for making me righteous. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for, for having a plan, a predetermined destiny, and getting me to the point of being like Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for the cross where your blood was shed, where your life was given for us. And so that all who trust in Jesus will be viewed through the lens of Jesus and we will be seen like Jesus. We thank you for that. Lord, we don't deserve it. We know that if we got what we deserve, we would go to hell. And so we're so thankful for the gift of righteousness found only through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you very much for being here. Hope you have a good week, and uh, hope we'll get a chance to see you throughout the week. If not, hope you have a very